week if you sit down and you'll go quiet. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you guys just go hush. Good morning, everyone, and I would like to welcome you all to our architecture panel with our HPIT experts. See if I can get this to work. Awesome. So my name is Erin Tilly, and I will be your moderator for today. I'm within the Software and Information Management Group within HPIT, and I find the story of our transformation over the past 10 years incredible, and it's allowed us to get to where we are today with a very forward-thinking architecture. So today we're going to be discussing that forward-thinking architecture in a panel format, and we have three of our HPIT experts here today. Our agenda, just to go over that real quickly, um, we're first going to have Graham Logan come up after uh, we do our introductions to talk over the guiding principles of our architecture end-to-end -end plan, and then we'll move into the panel session. So with the panel session, I'm going to start us off with a few questions and then open it up to all of you to ask your questions. If you can just raise a hand and wait for us to acknowledge you and then ask your question. We won't have any mic runners because it's in a small room, um, but if you could just speak up so that everybody can hear your question, that would be great. So without any further ado, make it happen. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Discover 2014. It's great to be here in Barcelona. Uh, my name is Venkat Shire. I lead the uh, Enterprise Architecture Organization for Global IT. Um, we have a team, essentially, that uh, you know, is largely responsible for the, the deployment of disruptive emerging technologies to run our enterprise. Uh, cloud is a major focus. It has been the focus for the last year. It will continue to be the focus next year as we go through what we are in the process of going through. So. Um, the, the major play from an architectural perspective is that the cloud becomes a primary architectural discipline for enterprise applications to run on. And that's the story we'll talk about today. Hi, I'm Linda Jarrett. I'm also in the Software and Information Management Group with Erin. And I uh, actually have the organization that uh, delivers advanced analytics and also information management architecture. So I've uh, really gotten to learn a lot over the last three years since we advanced our analytics journey, and very happy to share some of that with you today and how we got there. Hi, I'm, I'm Graham Logan. I host the Enterprise Application Architecture function in Global IT. Uh, team and I we really kind of focus on the white space, and I like to look at it, that falls between processes, systems, and organizations. And as I think we all work in organizations, uh, the gaps between organizations are always sometimes the most interesting to try and address, um, both politically and uh, aligning people to requirements. I've, uh, between myself and Ben Katesh and Linda and some others, we've been the driving force behind the definition of a reference architecture for HP. One of the first times I would say that the company, that I, in the 17 years I've been here, has actually documented and written down what we call a reference architecture. We'll, we'll step you through at a fairly high level and then open it up for you. So, um, before we can open up for questions, you've got to have an idea of what is reference architecture and how we got there and why we, we go there. So, I'm sure those of you who have been to Discover over the last couple of years will have heard the journey story from HPIT several times. Right? Um, five, six years ago, we did a massive data center consolidation. We have 96, 102, no, 85. 85 def def defined data centers, and then you can come up with help. Roughly 100. Down to we then called six pack for three main <coughs> locations with dual data centers. Okay. Um, and I look at that as is kind of an infrastructure driven transformation. Right? It was 
pretty well transparent to our business, the applications themselves abstracted and buffer those kind of radical changes in infrastructure, network capacity, disaster recovery, high availability from the business users, right? the capabilities that this simply change. And then after a few years we moved through to a, an application driven approach for transformation. And that was incredibly disruptive, right? Um, who in this room doesn't have a business or a, or a, or a stakeholder partner who truly believes it's their application? Okay? Now, they talk about their application, I own it, etc. But when you turn up in a conversation to say, well, we have five pricing systems, and our analysis says they all do the same thing, so we want to turn four off, that's pretty disruptive conversations. Okay? But it, we went so far on that journey, made some progress, but it was very, very disruptive. Over the last uh, two years or so, which is really where the uh, reference architecture starts to evolve from, we've taken a very much different approach, a much more of a synergistic uh, drive to transformation. And it's process-led. Again, you'll have heard the HP story around our adoption of Workday, uh, Salesforce, and we have about 30 other external SaaS platform providers that we work with. Um, the big difference here is that we've really adopted the process that that platform encapsulates, and the minute you do that, all these legacy systems are just irrelevant. They go away. There's no argument because everybody's moved their processes off. Okay? So that's really the, one of the driving changes um, in the current um, transformation. It's much more synergistic with our partners and stakeholders. <coughs> Now, HP is a very large organisation, okay? 300 and something thousand employees, uh, 300,000, sorry, employees, um, 200 odd countries, you know, any dimension of scale you, you take. Um, and we have in IT a very federated approach, right? Which is a polite way of saying a lot of people are able to say no when nobody's really sure who can say yes, okay? Um, that's particularly true across the architecture and the technology decisions. So, how we got to alignment around the reference architecture itself is an interesting story. Okay? Um, we facilitated and brought together really, there's a lot of discussion of do we bring the architect or do we bring the managers, etc. around. What we actually decided is we would bring what we would call the change agents. Some were senior architects, some were senior um, business analysts, some were actually from the business itself or operations teams. And we took them through a journey over several sessions, um, you know, level setting looking at what the future life of an employee, a partner, a customer should be envisaged, envisaged, that's what word, envisioned, thank you, envisioned, yeah. um, what a day in the life of a partner, a business partner for HP would be in three years from now, a customer, okay. We, we fed in what we saw as the, really the big shifts in the industry around application and data infrastructure, business intelligence and social media, and started to formulate out a view of the way our application landscape would look like, what are the technologies we needed to bring to bear. Okay? And from that, we produced three views. Okay? Uh, one optimized for speed, truly agility, I would say, more than speed. Uh, one around cost. Right? We're all in a cost constrained organization, I'm sure. Um, except my son doesn't believe he is, but it's a, a different story. Um, and then one for quality. Okay. So quality in our case was defects, removing defects and downtime, outages, etc. typical paradigms. Okay. Um, we eventually synthesized this into a view of the reference architecture, um, which we actually, on an ongoing basis, shared with our senior leadership across the organization. We got sign off at every stage, and the whole input to this journey was based upon the business strategy, not the IT strategy. So we weren't really interested in the IT strategy. We took the business directions, the business strategy, what were the new product offerings, what were the new engagement with the original customer, and, and synthesized that through the reference architecture view. That itself then led to an IT strategy. Mm -hmm. right? um, previous years we had iterated an IT strategy very insular, I inside of ourselves. So what does this start to look like? Okay. Well, before we go there, some guiding principles right, that we took to, into the process. We actually have about 40 guiding principles, but the key ones we looked at is, I'm sure this will resonate in many of your organisations, we have a large amount of technical debt. Okay? So I came into the corporation 17 years ago through Compaq, Compaq bought Tandem, Compaq bought Digital, which people Compaq, 
HP bought Autonomy, Autonomy bought 30 other companies. So there's a huge amount of legacy applications, technical debt, te older technologies, older application processes. So we really focus on what it should look like unbounded rather than constraining ourselves to how would we get there to start with. Um, our delivery process. One of, the, one of the secrets of the success in the earlier transformations around the data centers have been absolute, radical, rigid, fixed, stay with one set of processes. Right? There's one standard for this, there's one standard for that, and no exceptions. And that's not the modern way forward with applications, right? We have applications that need to iterate on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, you know, DevOps approach, right? We have applications that are critical to close the corporate finances. They need standard, long, you know, change management, rigid change control, quality measurements, and so on. Okay? So we developed a set of governance processes um, associated with our, our change management that were applicable to sort of three areas, <coughs> right? Um, our core ba core applications, so the close the books. You know, I personally want to make sure the payroll system is always up and I need to be paid on a regular basis. Um, we have the ones that are really differentiating it. What differentiates HP in the marketplace? Okay, that's an interesting question. I'm sure you'll hear that from other speakers. Um, and then what is truly innovative? Okay, using our own products. How do we take our own internal um, offerings that we sell to the market and use them internally? And how do we innovate? And we developed a set of standards and governance processes associated with each layer. And then cost structure, our favourite one. Right? I'm Scottish, we have a reputation of it like the Dutch. Um, we like to keep our money in our own pockets. Okay? Um, so like a lot of IT organisations, we have evolved a fairly fixed cost basis around data centre consolidation, infrastructure, all the right then, all the depreciations. Um, the ratio is roughly about 633, you know, two thirds fixed, one third flexible. Um, and we really need to, to move that needle on. One of the things we looked at is do we need to move from 66% fixed to 40% fixed? We actually set ourselves a goal of saying no, we need to move to where we can adjust the ratio dynamically. Okay? So that means as we start to look more seriously at outsourced software providers, we look more seriously at the way we um, acquire labour. Okay? And technologies that we onboard and offboard technologies rapidly, okay? and, and the way we do contracts, how do we do contract? Fixed ELAs are very interesting. We tend to get the best price point, but they also lock you in. Okay? You go to a per capita basis with software vendor or SaaS vendor. It's much cheaper when you're a small company. Forty nine dollars a month for each hour system, great. Okay? You do that with three hundred thousand employees. Yeah, it's a different conversation. Okay? So we did a lot of work on how do we create these contract management processes that can be flexible. This led us through, and again, this is a very high level view. We're happy to dig into the details and, and as we go through the discussion, okay? Um, of what we call the reference architecture view. As you can see, it really sort of starting from the bottom, you know, core HP, um, intellectual property right across the floor. We can share with you the products that we're using in the, in the reference architecture view. Our infrastructure layer, as Meg has introduced, singly focused on, on, on cloud, right? Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Software defined networking, the data centers, and we'll go into more of that. Okay. Um, a heavy focus on data, as Linda introduced, around our business intelligence, our analytics, how do we drive analytical based user experiences, for instance. Okay. Security down the left hand side. I think, like a lot of companies uh, from an IT point of view, security sometimes is the thing that we, in we, we inspect into the final product, and we're trying to embed it into the design and engineering from the beginning. Again, full stack with HP product sets on the right hand, left hand side. Up through the user experience, mobility first. So what does that really mean? It's not about having an application on a mobile phone, right? It's about an approach to producing applications with enough abstraction that allow different clients to reuse the same capabilities. Whether that be a desktop application, whether it's a browser based application, whether it's a mobile phone. The same core business functionality, uh, data delivery APIs being called by different clients. On the right hand side, um, external party, parties. Um, HP has roughly 200,000 partners. Okay? We onboard about 1,000, um, let's say, EDI in a general sense, right? just whether it's XML or with SOAP or true any fact type EDI connections a month. So about 1,000 different connections we brought up and down a month. Um, how do we scale that? 
um, and provide an on-demand basis for connecting your business partners and different models. And that becomes clearly fairly relevant as we um, acquire new companies or dispose of companies, okay? and acquire partners and customers on a regular basis. Okay? So with that, we're actually going to leave the reference architecture as a background as we go through the panel uh, seven questions. Thank you so much. So hopefully that gave you um, a good baseline for where we are in HPIT with our reference architecture and gave you some food for thought and sparked a lot of questions with you. We walked through a little bit of our transformation and if you'd like to know more about that, we can definitely talk more at the Guru Bar about that and there's also another session that I'm going to point you to after this is over that relates to that. But as far as architecting our future at HP, let's go ahead and start that off. And I'm going to ask the first question of Grant. <laughs> so with this end-to-end -end approach, um, is this just relevant for HP, for a company the size of HP and complexity of HP, or is this relevant uh, to other companies? So my, my opinion, and I will we'll share, um, I believe it's relevant to HP and I believe it's relevant to corporations and companies of any size. I mean, it's, let's, let's be clear, right? This is a fairly high level view you're seeing today, right? Motherhood and apple pie in some respects, right? But the process of, of actually having people align to and, and come to the table to define the architecture, I think is the strength. And I, certainly in my experiences um, within HP, within previous smaller companies, with some of the consulting work I do externally with customers, um, what I see is that journey itself is important, almost as important as the outcome. So yes, I, I think it's applicable to a corporation the size of HP today, or in fact the size of corporations will be tomorrow. Um, I've seen a very similar architecture discussion I've had with a, a relatively small company, a few million, um, 45 people size company, and they've taken a similar model to bed from us, and they've adjusted it to themselves, they're much more focused on the the user experience, their product is a, is a, you know, a, a web experience, obviously. But having said that, they still have to manage HR, they still have to manage finances. So yes, I think the reference architecture is applicable across companies and corporations of the world, really any size. No, I think that's right on. You know, I don't think our challenges are any more unique than uh, in all of yours, probably. Um, you know, our scale is probably a little different but the challenges remain the same, you know, whether it's infrastructure, data information, the application side of things, or integration, but more importantly, the user dimension. Now, that's one of the focus areas moving forward is our user dimension. These challenges are very much relevant in all sizes of organization, you know, and uh, you know, with new emerging technologies like cloud, these challenges become even more relevant to all of us. So. Yeah, speaking of cloud, uh, what unique benefits does uh, right. cloud, OpenStack, Helium uh, bring? Yeah, so we've been on our cloud journey for roughly, last Barcelona I said we were in infancy in one of the presentations that I did. I think we're starting to get to the maturity curve. <coughs> for us, the cloud is a transformative engine. It's not a technology play. It's a play specifically geared toward addressing some of our key business needs. Uh, our key business needs really shifted from you know, what we were after our first transformation to more of an agile approach. The cloud offers us a platform to do that. And now with Helion OpenStack, it gives us an engine, a platform to completely transform and modernize our application stack, which is really what Grant introduced is the second phase of our transformation, if you will, or really like the way I like to think about it, it's a continuous transformation engine. And these are the platforms that we would choose to accomplish some of our business goals. Great. Oh, I was going to say, definitely as a consumer of the cloud infrastructure that we have, I mean, what it's done for our applications is given us great flexibility so we can easily ramp up and ramp down in, you know, days, minutes versus months and years. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it brings us sort of methodology to the way we think about designing applications, I mean the process and how we abstract processes down. And it gives it a model, as you say, as an engine to encapsulate um, a lot of the, you know, choose your favorite paradigm of the last 10 years, you know, services oriented to architecture, believe or don't believe, right? These things are fairly black and white in people's minds, you know. I'm, I'm a believer, but I don't believe in the real granularity, right? I'm not a microservice believer, for instance, right? Um, certainly not in a corporate 
cooperation with lots of legacy. Um, but I think it gives us a thought process, a methodology, it gives us a chance to, um, well, imperative, a chance, imperative to stop and say, what is really the key capability to bring value? Right? How will we want to realize those to the user base? And then express those through this paradigm of separation of the user experience, separation out of you know, with, with security embedded, bringing it down to data so that analytics becomes not an afterthought. So analytics no longer becomes a, well, let's extract the data and look at, analyze it next week. It becomes a live part of the ongoing process. Yeah, one of the keys that I do want to touch on, the picture that you see is specifically geared toward a shift in the way we think as yes. an IT company. Right? So we went from standards, rigorous standards, to consolidation as a core component of realizing the business benefits of shifting from 4% to total revenue to 2%. We went from that to being an IT service provider, or IT as a value creator. So the reference architecture that you see addresses those dimensions that are most relevant. And by capturing this and actually working our entire architectural dimension according to this, we provide that value to our business. And that's what this is all about. It's very much an external focused aspect, attribute of the architecture. And that's what you see on the screen right now. Yeah, so um, Linda, you mentioned that you work in some the cloud and we haven't really done something data and analytics, but that's another major play. So I want to give you some time to talk about how you're really uh, for and we're really embracing big data um, and really going forward in that. Can you speak to that at all? Sure. So one of the big changes that uh, analytics brings to the table is the need for speed, for agility, for flexibility. And one of the things that we started to move away from is we had a very large centralized data warehouse. So there can only be one, one version of the truth, you know, and everybody has to go to that place to get data. Well, when you start trying to do analytics, that's very inhibiting, and it doesn't actually allow you the flexibility or the agility you need to be able to get data right now, to be able to turn those, those answers in seconds versus days versus months. So what this reference architecture brings to the table, it allows us that, or starts to allow us that flexibility. So how do we get data faster? How do we get it into the hands of the people that actually can do something with it and make those predictions so we can uh, benefit our business faster and better? Yeah, I think one of the um, kind of example of the change in mindset is the centralized single version of the truth, right? I, I'm willing to put money on the table that everybody here realizes the single version of the truth of their company is in Excel. Right? Um, and you know, we had a sort of custom written BI tool. And we, we know the, the, the questions we get asked in the past, which we said no to, that come up again and again is why can't I just simply connect Excel to the corporate warehouse? The answer used to be no security, da da da. Now the question is you can, now let's work out what is the technology options we need to enforce. What is appropriate levels of access control and security? Right? Um, I think some of that sort of mindset has changed the way we look at it. If I just look at application architecture, you know, when I took over the function, I inherited a whole bunch of standards documents, right? You know, every of standards documents, right? And now I've got internal audit approaching me about updating these standards documents, and I'm saying, I don't want the standards documents. I want to lay out selection criteria and get away from determining this package is the approved. I want to say, what are the characteristics that make a particular package, technology, appropriate in a corporation of size? And that particularly comes to software as a service selection. Right? Um, you know, if you look at our, our SaaS play, we have a large you know, workday, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the big players. We do business with a lot of small companies that are in the SaaS business. Okay? When you dig under the covers, okay, one of the most important questions to ask yourself, what is the exit strategy for the company's bonus. Because most of them, their exit strategy is to be purchased by Google. Okay? Instagram moment, 13 employees, $1.2 billion. Okay? All 13 employees got an equal share. I would like to be named Instagram at that point in time, I can tell you. Right? Um, so that doesn't mean you can't do business with them or you shouldn't, but it means you need to think about it a little more carefully. Where are they really landing their data? Oh, we're sitting on S3 and Amazon. Great, well, are they? Or are they sitting on an S3 that's in a shared data, you know, one of the Amazon outreach centers that's actually maybe in a, 
uh, a geographical location that your corporation has challenged. Okay? We're a large American corporation. We run it, you, most of you guys are here are European. I am as well, but I'm Scottish, sort of European. Um, you know, the whole question about safe harbor laws right? and, and you know, data privacy concerns. I, I lived in Germany for eight years. Um, I, I, you know, the, I can't even pronounce it these days, the data, I guess you should say, whatever it is, you know, data privacy laws are very rigid and so on. So you've got to think through some of these things, and that's what we, backing up this reference architecture, is a set of processes, a set of engagement models, um, a, a set of um, guidelines of how to make a decision, not just this is the decision going to it. And then, Graham, I think it would be also fair to say that this reference architecture is built on what our move forward is. We anticipate in the next three years we'll shift from a largely traditional IT to largely a hybrid cloud and SaaS. Yes. You know, we'll, we'll shift to a 90% hybrid cloud slash slash SaaS model with 10% being in the traditional space. So the reference architecture provides us with what we need to enable that to make, make that happen. So that's that's a pretty key attribute of this also. So once you get it started, we, we can. Yeah. yeah, I just have to ask one question. <laughs> well, there must be a question for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Question, um, Justin Warren from um, on the blog from Australia. Um, you mentioned this is the first time you've actually documented your reference architecture. Why? <laughs> like, wh I, why documented it all? Mm -hmm. Why now? Good question. So, why documented at all? Really, the, the reality is um, the journey of documenting it brought a very federated model that we had implemented about two and a half years ago. We went from a very centralized, all decisions were made in one place, right? So, you know, I, I, that, you know, I see a manager in the organization, executive in the organization, I wanted to spend $60 on a piece of software, I had to get the CIO approved. <coughs> I spent more money arguing about why I wanted to spend the money. Um, so the journey to this federated, or you could say we overcorrected, okay? So bringing to the midpoint, this was partly a mechanism to bring us to the midpoint of balance between the very centralized draconian approaches which are now present in general, just, just um, and the kind of um, you know, business imperatives first, which were driving costs, but I'll be clear with you. As we created a federated model, each of the CIOs made their own independent decisions, we, we realized that one of us, the, the groups of us who were still working horizontally, that there was a lot of duplication being built, okay? Which is great if it supports agility, but at some point it becomes a burden in the nine point. And I think that answer, that really is, it covers the, the why now as well. Is I would say, you know, the pendulum swung. Uh, the secret's always not to be hit in the back of the head as it swings back. Okay? And we were trying to balance things into the middle, which is very, very centralized um, approach with no, <coughs> no empowerment at all to a, a very decentralized, fully empowered, business imperative drives everything approach. But realizing at the end of the day, somebody needs to represent the corporation which is the sum of all these, all, all these apparently independent business units who are making decisions. For the shareholder values, not at the EG level, enterprise group or the software group, the shareholder values at the HP corporation level. So we had to make those balances. I think the other part about documenting and just getting it out there, um, it helps you realize where you have gaps and where are you missing something. Um, just, just having those conversations and having to put it down on paper and getting it in front of your business partners, getting in front of your other IT partners, what you realize is that as good as you thought your, your system is that's in place, there's things missing that are crit critical to customers. It's the same gaps across all the different business units. So just having those conversations was very helpful for our organization in particular to go, okay, we're actually missing this key critical <coughs> capability, even as good as we thought we were, we have to do this to move forward in our you know, journey. I think another part of it is um, about documenting it is, we all use words, right? we throw words around, right? we, we've said cloud several times. Right? <laughs> I actually ban that word in my organization. Right? I don't think it helps explain between technology people anything. Okay? Um, and in recognition, I first started moving through in this stuff, we soon quickly realized that he said cloud, I said cloud, and we really didn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> so we started to document it, we started to get some of these alignments. Okay? 
mean, big data. I was in a, a real, real story with a very large corporation, right? bigger than HP, uh, makes lots of electronics like phones and TVs, based in South Korea. I won't name the company. Um, bilateral translation into another language, and they talked about their mega data systems. Okay? And eventually, at lunchtime, I went through and said, So, can we put a number on mega data? Right? 90 terabytes. I go mega data and I go 6.25 petabytes, which is one of our larger clusters. So, you know, you, you've got to get to the facts and either writing them down, putting numbers against things, really helps with conversations. And as we work across the federated models, all of us, you know, having almost that taxonomy of, to, to baseline conversation is really important for getting through things. Good question. Okay. Nice accent, by the way. A follow up, if I may. Um, so, you've documented it now. It's probably out of date already. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Are you going to maintain the documentation? Yes, we are. Yeah. It's an ongoing journey. As we have established the governance processes that, that we were kind of a little bit lax on over the last couple of years, this becomes the vehicle for keeping it as fresh on a site basis as you can, of, of ejecting certain decisions we made, because with hindsight things will improve. We made certain decisions which I don't think are now applicable, which we will reverse out and replace as we go forward on a, on a life cycle map. I used to work in a university. <laughs> so the thought process, that's a good question. Um, it's so do you provide IT in the university or you're an academic? IT. IT. So I was an academic, right? And the thing I found with academia and the same with this corporation, there's a lot of egos in the room, right? And um, individually they take more space than the room allows. So how do you level set? How do you give those egos the place to feel that their input has been listened to, has been um, taken on board? That doesn't mean that they will see their input on the output. Okay? Um, and part of that really was a lot of pre-work with the, the, the really the key change agents in the organizations, right? The five or six of us who got together and planned the journey, right? Um, and we were fairly careful of who we elected to bring into the next level of the journey of the broader audience. We had the people, it wasn't about who organizationally was appointed. It was who had the organization kind of almost crowdsourced to be recognized as the experts. And there's a big difference in that. I'm a community person, right? I, I believe in open source, I, I maintain some open source software out there. And you know, the, everybody has a chance to read uh, John O'Bacon's book, The Art of Community. He, he established Ubuntu, um, uh, well, not Ubuntu, the, the, the holding companies, um, processes around community management. And you know, there's a real difference between appointing somebody to be in charge of something and a natural leader coming to the forefront that the organization accepts. And that's really what we looked at yeah. in Bobby. Yeah, so, so one of the key attributes for a federate or operating in a federated model, quite frankly, you know, we're horizontal functions across our company, you know, uh, 300 and whatever thousand employees with four very powerful CIOs, BU CIOs, is to show them the business value for each of these dimensions. And that always resonates. That's how we build alignment. Nothing, nothing triggers, at least from an inward focus, from an HP focus perspective. Nothing triggers alignment more like business value. If you show them the value of mobile apps in the user dimension, for example, and the fact that their employees can be more productive and get business done faster, that's a powerful dimension <laughs> to rely on. Same with the cloud. You know, what used to take 60 to 90 days to provision a server now takes a matter of minutes. Our best week of virtualization provisioning of a VM would take six to 10 days. Our worst would take six weeks. We shift from that to three to four hours, and that's a pretty powerful story. Great business value. You asked about bringing things together, too. I think one of the other interesting pieces of information that came out as we're going through this journey was the fact that we actually don't need to bring as much of the information together as what we originally thought. So even for some of the horizontal functions like finance and HR, they were really being run very differently in the various BUs. 
So whereas before we thought we have to bring everything together, it has to be in one place, what we found out is there's actually very little of that data in the information management side that needed to be consolidated where you had to have a single corporate view. So we've narrowed that down and focused on what are those key pieces of data, you know, which elements actually do have to be consolidated and rolled up, and that's what we focused on when we do uh, consolidate it. The rest of it, we just leave federated. We let, we let the business units make their own decisions because that way they're more flexible, they can run the business like they need to, and it gives them the agility and the, what, you know, the autonomy to make those decisions without having to consult with their peers. Yeah. I think if you think about a, like a canonical data model, right? What are the four or five elements that everybody you must define and everybody should agree on? And then the payload that goes with it, who cares? So I mean, I, if you look at an order, right, we've spent years arguing over what a, a well, it's the product, right? We've spent hundreds of times arguing about Facebook. Um, energetically discussing, right? What a product air model should look like, right? No, it comes down to part number, description, um, availability, the rest of it is kind of business like unit. You know, Driven, right? Why? You know, the characteristics of a printer are very, very different to that of software. Are we really even going to have a model that you know consolidates all of those different characteristics together? The answer is yes. We came up with it. Could we physically implement it? Well, you know, right. software, software. But there are sometimes you just shouldn't do things. Um, you know, so we sort of coming off to that kind of approach. What are the four or five things that we should align across the Federated Towers, and what are the things we all agree we would align? And I think that's really important because if you leave things in a vacuum of undefined, right, you get into this problem as I'm not sure I can make a decision there, but I don't know who to ask. So we've been fairly clear is these are the things that we've defined centrally and we'll continue to manage centrally. These are the things we will not ever define centrally. Go off and make your decisions. And that clears a lot of that procrastination, frankly, sometimes excuse making, because people don't sometimes want to make the decisions. So, I mean, when we defined this, when we actually built this, we sat in a room and we invited all of the key architects across all of our BUs to attend those sessions. So what you see is alignment from that perspective and therefore sponsorship from the CIOs. That, that's critically important. You know, you, we may not agree on all of the canonical data model aspects, but we sure as heck would agree that we need that, that that's, what this gives us, essentially. Sorry, go ahead. So, why don't you tell me about this one? If you don't use them, why do you have to guess? Guess what you want to do? How do you get away from what you found it, you will fix it, and why? Are you protecting the architecture from it? And then, how do you prioritize? Because you're expected to prioritize. Yeah, so, so, so what, protecting the organization, right? I, I don't see that as a need to, right? If we add volume, we get some protection. If we don't add volume, frankly, I'll be the first to shut down the organization. Yeah, okay. um, how do we kind of, I would say this is a set of guiding lights, right? So we know this is the direction we're going in, right? But let's be clear, we run, again, choose a number, uh, depending on your definition, 19 to 26 classic SAP instances, right? Very heavily modified. Right? Will they ever? Will those ever be modelled into a fully cloud abstracted layer? No way. You can't do it, right? But we can adopt processes and adopt the newer style of SAP build platform. Okay, and move towards it. So it's a, it's like having a a, a map, right? We know where north is, right? We may not go directly north. But we, even when we go slightly west or east, we're aware of the, the final direction we're trying to go to. And instilling that across the organization, people feel the ownership is making their sense because of the, the buy-in model, right? Um, it becomes almost self-government. You know, it's not just the three, four, five of us at core who are evangelizing this thing, right? That's a great job title. We do, yeah. I would always want to do the job. Right? <laughs> First time I met somebody from Microsoft, they had evangelist on their card. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Um, we do evangelize it, but we have, um, a, a, carrying on the church metaphor, a congregation of people that evangelize on our behalf, okay? as, as a true believers. I sound like a preacher on US TV. <laughs> so you make them want to do this. Yeah. That's, that's what us as leaders we do constantly is to, you know, we can only guide on, on a high level. The details, if you let them own it and they're accountable for it, 
it starts to become very real, very fast. But I think the change in mindset too is not to force it. It's, you know, we're here for you. We have this available for you to use, to leverage. We think it adds value. We can tell you why it adds value. If you don't want to leverage it, that's your choice and you can go and do your own direction. And that's actually been very helpful in our organization as well. Um, several years ago, the, the organization I'm in now was actually seen as very dictator-like. Nobody wanted to work with them. But it was because they were taking that approach of, you must do it this way, you must use this software, you have to do it. Now we take the approach of, we'd love for you to, to work with us. We, we want to help you get to where you're going, but you don't have to work with us if you don't want to. You can go your own direction and do whatever you want. Yeah, the checks and balances are on the financial side. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not completely free-flowing either. You know, I mean, we're, about, we're still a growing company. You know, uh, growth is a bit major factor. So cost constraints are huge. But what this gives us is a standardization to get there. You know, this is with the end goal in mind. I think another part of it is, um, we haven't really talked about the HP and HP story here, but a, a, most of this reference architecture leverages every on our products. Okay? What a surprise. Okay? We tend to get good prices for them. Yeah. <laughs> Not always. But we like um, and that becomes a very powerful message to the business unit leaders. Not the IT CIOs per se, but the business unit leaders. Because they, you know, we, we're asked to stand here. Right? My job is not to sell. I don't get sales comp. My job is to do IT inside the corporation. I spend about a third of my time with customers. I know Venkatesh is similar. I think Linda is similar. You know, the story of practitioners applying HP's piece technology is a very powerful story in the marketplace. Okay, so that is also one of the reasons um, that it, it's become self-sustaining because our business unit you know, teams, who really should just be defining capabilities and requirements. Are the ones who say, no, no, we, we, we want to use this. We want to use this system over here with Vertica because you know we want to be able to have a story in the marketplace about corporate information warehouse converted to Vertica or something. It's a powerful message. Yeah, we become HP's biggest customer, and um, what's great about that story is I don't have to use HP products. I choose to use them because I'm, I want to use what's best in breed. And there's. There's times where we've chosen not to use something, but we go back to the product team and we tell them why. We give them the information of this is what we need, this is how we would be able to leverage it if the product had that. And overall, it makes it for a better story for why we use our own products and also helps in the product development side as well. Yeah, I've been at HP for 21 years, and I can tell you IT has never had the influence that we have within our product community. Uh, we, you know, we consume our champagne in a big way, but here's the deal. It, if, if it doesn't work for our enterprise and to our scale, we simply don't deploy. Okay. Or we find alternate solutions or bring those products and mature the product as a result of our requirements. We do this on a routine. Every day we do this with our business. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, I have a question on my end. Um, so this is a more generic question for each of you. Um, Whenever we talk about this, and I think Linda, you, you mentioned um, a change in mindset, uh, there are some really big hurdles um, that we have with people, with process, with technology, um, in, in, in implementing this and in getting this um, actually to be successful. So what is the greatest shift in your area that you feel is needing to be made? What, what is your biggest challenge and how are you approaching it? So it's never technology. So technology always tends to be the easy part. Um, normally it's people. It's getting just people to think differently, to understand that how something worked yesterday is not how it works today. And to really change the culture of your organization, to, to really act differently, to behave differently, to understand that Okay, SDLC was a great project methodology five years ago and it worked great then. It doesn't work necessarily now for what we're trying to do. Having very, very strict release management, change management, where everything has to be tested a thousand times and a hundred different people have to sign off on it. That worked great five years ago. It doesn't work today. And just getting people to accept that and understand that they have to change how they do things. It's always the hardest part. Yeah, and some of this is boundaries, you know, we put boundaries on, on ourselves, right? So it's the, the tower boundary methodologies, you know, this, that's by far, for a large company like ours, the, the biggest challenge. You know, getting people to not have 
fiefdoms. It's a big, big deal for us. You know, everybody has their own little, and they continue to build their organizations. So those shifts are our biggest shift. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I can. I had a boss once. Was that for yeah, no, I, it was <laughs> but I had a boss once who remember telling me about management of change. Right? I was a young academic, first time in the real industry, and he told me about management of change. And the gentleman said to me, "It's really easy. Change or leave." <laughs> it was his bad methodology of management of change. Right? We're kind of a little softer than that. Yeah. Um, but I agree with Linda. Right? It, 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 there's boundaries that people perceive are there that are no longer there. So communicate, communicate, communicate. Right? We're changing. Why are we changing? What's changed? Repeat, repeat, repeat. Simple, clear messaging. That's why if you actually look at this reference architecture, there are gaps. It's not just gaps that are we've missed something. There are, there are truly things that in the use questions. Well, why is that there? Because it makes the messaging clear. Right? It becomes a vehicle as the poster child of taking it through. So I think communication is is that people re realizing and, and helping the organization realize that um, management, stakeholders' perception of IT has changed. <coughs> um, the barriers, as, as I say, the barriers that were there are no longer there. Okay? Um, you know, and, and getting people off of those little training wheels, if you will. Okay? Um, you know, agile, agility, you know, choose, your, choose your favorite methodology, right? Um, there are some things we have to do differently, though. I think investment for horizontal, these type of capabilities. One of my business sponsors, uh, I also have to look after mass data and HP. Um, they keep saying, well, I can, I can do this for five pounds a month. I says, you can, but they don't build the solution the first time they have a five pound a month customer. Right? They spent 20 million two years ago evolving the platform. Right? So we need to change some of our funding models, okay? so that we invest in a roadmap of capabilities rather than reacting to requests of, cap of capabilities, okay? So that we're actually ahead of the curve when somebody asks for it. So we can, you know, agility is not about reacting fast. It's about having worked out what people wanted before and built towards it. I think that's one of the biggest uh, pan-organizational changes that we need to understand. Process and funding models to make these kind of strategic investments um, to get ahead of the curve. And we're adopting a double of small. And that helps us significantly, especially some of the agile compute. Um, it's going to help us, and we're in its infancy. Hopefully, next Barcelona we can talk about the maturity aspect. Yeah. 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 Um, again, one of those words. Okay, um, so to me, and I'm sure we all have different interpretations. To me, um, X is a service, everything is a service, what we call it, um, is about abstraction, okay? encapsulating capability in, um, in an entity that is, let's say, callable, right? So I'm I kind of, I guess, I'm actually about the same age as most of you guys, I suspect, some of you, anyway. Um, you know, we talk about APIs today, right? When I was young, we talked about dynamic link libraries, right? Same sort of thing. You encapsulate and you call something, right? Um, and when I look at everything as a service, to me, that's what it is. It's I have ability to instantiate something I require when I require it and release it back for reuse when I no longer require it. Now, whether that is a true cloud-like service to an API call, you know, a piece of code that runs and calls something for REST, or whether it's a request I fill in a web form, as it were, it's still kind of, there's a defined offering. I can consume when I need to consume it, and I can, part of the contract of that consumption is I give it back when I don't want it. So you hear phrases like late binding, early release, these kind of phrases come into bear. We can get into all sorts of nuances about infrastructure, application, platform, but like really the characteristics are the same. It's something I can consume when I need it, um, with a, a programmatic request type, and then it must be on a cut. <laughs> yeah, the microphone's going down. <laughs> so, um, I think the other thing about anything as a service is the focus is all of a sudden on the user, making things very user centric, abstracting the technology from them so that they don't they don't understand the complexity, they don't have to see the complexity behind it. But making them the center of this is this is to make the user's life better, to make it easier for them, not to make IT's life better. 
And that's really the, again, the mind shift and the change. It's all about the user, not about our organization. Exactly. Yeah, and I guess a follow-up, are there any limitations you see in, implement, in enabling the as-a-service yes. capabilities? Yes, several. Um, it comes down to how you architect, not just the technology, but you can architect your process and applications. Um, every level of service has an effective availability. You go through five levels of service, five, five, five nines is about 96% availability. So you need to think very carefully as how you, how you handle when the service is not available. Right? How, how do you get back on that? How do you expose that to the level of you? How do you um, fail gracefully in the eyes of the consumer? Yeah, so you know, our vision of applications three years from now will be things that are completely abstracted from platform, from, up from OSs, simply you bring a code as a developer and simply run it, consume whatever infrastructure is on the back end of it. We also believe that by doing that, this is what's going to bring us agility. We build applications that are inherently resilient, that fail by themselves, fail over by themselves. So the need for a traditional IT space where a ton of testing is not required these applications figure a way to fail themselves or restart themselves. So we see that in three years as a very real opportunity for us to move forward. So with the time that we have, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I just want to one basically that takeaway. So some of what you're talking about is our skills that IT is traditionally not very good at, communicating with users or you know, yep. change management sure. and that sort of thing. How do organizations or IT organizations go and get those skills? So, I'm going to, re uh, I'm going to repeat just so other people heard that. Um, he's asking about how does IT go and get the skills that they don't naturally come by? Um, communications and change management. I'll give you uh, an example there. Um, this is a byline that we have become slightly, certainly, we've become slightly. Sexier? Is that right? That's right. 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 What's well, like more? <laughs> IT used to be a place that nobody ever wanted to work for. Right? You were in the business, you never wanted to work in IT, you were in operations, and what you wanted to do. We've actually become much more attractive as a location, and as part of that is we've brought communications people in from marketing. Right? Um, we have um, brought business operations people in to be program managers and requirements gathering folks and kind of putting people on the other side of the equations. And part of that is because we become a more attractive place to work, right? Because people see the value we add. Um, I think it's difficult to upscale a you know a 15 year season you know methodology project manager into a communications person. Right? You really need to say we need three or four specialist communications people who that is their decision. Bring them into the organisation. Have them, them drive a program around communication. I mean, you're in your part of that example, right? I've seen how code I would run in production. Um, <laughs> I've seen my own code. You mentioned applications fail by themselves. My apps always fail by themselves. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but it all starts to restart. You don't restart really it. <laughs> so I think part of it is that is it's it's a mindset to recognise that. You need to go outside where you normally hire. Um, we have a reverse mentoring program inside HP. It's been some incredible success. Where we brought non-IT discipline college grads. One was an architect, for instance. And I don't mean what I call myself as an architect. I mean buildings and windows and things like that. And they redesigned a supply chain management process. Just, just conceived it completely different. Right? Just different ways of thinking. And using the, that in a reverse mentor approach of having, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting on in life. You know, moved on. Whatever. You know, having that 26, 27 year old uh, young out of college who's energetic and enthusiastic, right? Anybody that's got a dog, you know, to get a little older, sometimes buying a puppy makes the dog a little bit more lively. So bringing the, the generation, well, not generation X, what's the millennials? You, you young millennials. folks. <laughs> you young folks. No, millennials <laughs> in, um, have really changed the shape of our organisation. Um, and, and not trying to shape people and say, here's your email. We as management change and say, actually, it's okay to communicate with us on text message and an OC chat. We don't need to have an email about things. Right? Sometimes legal and audit likes an email, but that's another story. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's driving some of that, going outside the bounds. Number one is, to your point, recognise you haven't got the skills first. If you don't recognise the problem, you can never fix it. I think it's also about making sure that we reward people for those skills. So you're, you don't just get recognised in IT for being a good developer anymore. That you still get recognized for that because we obviously still need those skills that are very important. But you you also can get recognition for being a great communicator, or for being a change agent, or for those types of skills that you know, quite frankly, a few years ago weren't recognized at all, and people left IT because that was their passion, and they were doing a great job at communications or things like that. But they weren't being recognized for it um, in IT. It's, this is not an easy answer. It's simply not an easy answer. We're still working toward that. As Graham said, these are the steps we're taking, but we have a ton of work to do. Yes. Our, our hiring is 75% shifted to early career hires. That's a significant shift for us from our workforce, and it's really the, the rebirth of our workforce. Those shifts are very hard, but the advantage is we're providing them with modern IT. And as he said, this is a great place to work. Yeah. So that's, that's a big difference. Yeah, I really appreciate it getting to work in HPIT um, and being one of those people. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're at time right now, and so I just want to flash up um, a slide where you can get more information, and if you have any questions that you didn't ask, um, we have additional sessions that are related. We talked about um, this transformation that HPIT has undergone in getting here. We wouldn't be talking about this today unless we had gone through that that transformation that at times is painful. Um, but we learned a lot of lessons in. Um, that is going to be covered by Dick Steiner um, on Wednesday at 11 a.m. But then you can also come to the Guru Bar. And, and then Linda and Graham and Becky Tesh all uh, will be speaking at later times um, here at Discover. And so we have those sessions listed as well. Um, so you can also come and speak to us at the Guru Bar. Um, all three of them will be at the HPIT Guru Bar, which is in Hall 4. It's as soon as you walk in, so it's really easy to see it. They'll be there in 30 minutes for the next, for an hour after that. And so just come by, um, talk to us, come say hi, and um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.